Two weeks ago, we started a sermon series that we called Children Matter. And over the past two weeks, we've learned some of the most amazing things. We've learned that one of the prevailing themes all throughout scripture is that Jesus consistently and constantly talked about how important children really were. Look at what Jesus said in Mark 10, 14. He said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to, in other words, it's in their possession. The kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Then he said, I tell you the truth, anyone, man, woman, young, old, rich, poor, anybody who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And the Bible says he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. Now, what made Jesus' statement so peculiar is that in the first century, especially in Roman culture, most people thought the children were completely insignificant. Nobody cared. They were nothing more than random faces in the crowd. But Jesus thought something completely different. Because Jesus said things about children that he did not say about any other group of people in all of human history. And this morning, this morning, we're going to take an in-depth look at what the Bible has to say about how to make children matter in our church. And whether you know it or not, this is without a doubt one of the most important topics that we could ever discuss as a congregation, and here's why. It's because studies show that 85% of the people who will give their life to Christ at some point in their life, do so between the ages of four and 14. That means that if any of the young people who come to Velocity Church were to cross the line of faith at some point in their life, if they were to take a step toward Jesus, 85%, eight out of 10 of them, will do so between the ages of four and 14. That means that the way that we care for the young people who come to this church has eternal implications. So what we're going to do is this. We're going to look at several things that we as a church can do to make the children matter, the people who come here. Because just like anyone else, the young people who come to this church are critically important. So we're going to look at some of the things that we can do. And the first one is so simple. If we really want to make the children who come to Velocity Church matter, then we as adults, we need to do our best to make this an environment where young people know that they are loved and they're accepted. Look at what Jesus said about that in John 13, 34. He said, a new command I give you. In other words, hey, you guys remember all those commands in the Old Testament? I gave you the big 10, you know, the 10 commandments, and I gave you all kinds of laws. He goes, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you a new commandment. And the new commandment is this. I want you as my people to love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, all men will know that you are truly my disciple if you love one another. Now, don't miss what Jesus said there. Because Jesus said, hey, the world's going to know. Everybody's going to know that you're truly my disciple. Everybody's going to know that you walk in my direction. Not by how many times you go to church on Sunday. And it's not by the prayers that you pray. And they're not going to know that you're my disciple by all the verses that you memorized. He goes, the world's going to know that you truly chase after me by the love that you have for other people. And one of the biggest ways that we can show the children who come here how much they matter is by letting them know how much we care about them. When I was a little boy, my parents took me to church every week. Okay? And I don't, don't just mean on Sunday morning. My parents took me to church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, and every Wednesday night. And to be honest, when I was a little boy growing up in church, it was totally confusing to me. 
Because I had no idea what the pastor was talking about. I had no idea what the Bible says. The only thing I knew about church growing up was this. I knew when to stand. I knew when to sit. If the pastor said something to me, I knew what to say back. But as far as understanding the Bible or how to have a relationship with God, I was completely clueless. However, there is one thing about my home church that I will never forget. I will never forget the people who showed a genuine interest in me when I was just a little boy. Because there were about five or six adults who went out of their way to show me how much they cared about me. One of them was an elderly woman whose name was Vera Clemens. Vera was this real short lady who was in her late 70s. She moved from America. She moved to America from Hungary. She didn't speak English very well. She didn't have a lot of money. And the reason I know that is because every Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, she wore the same tattered brown slacks and the same tattered dress shirt. And she wore them every time she came to church. But the thing that I remember most about Vera isn't the clothes that she wore. The thing that I remember most about this woman is how much she loved me. Because every time she saw me at church, she would grab me by the shoulders and give me a big hug. And then in her broken English, she would ask me how I was doing. And I just thought she was great. So I would tell her about school or sports or a movie that I saw. And as I was telling her about what's going on in my life, she was legitimately interested. Because as I was telling her about some of the stuff, she would stand there with this big smile on her face, just listening to me. And then when I was done talking, she would always bend down. And because like, I was a little shorter than her, she would go, now you know how much I love you. Scott, you know, I'm praying for you. And then she would hug me every time she saw me. Now, those events took place over 40 years ago. But I will never forget the impact that she made because she was one of the people who did her best to show me how much she cared. And I want every child who comes to Velocity Church to feel the very same way. I want them to know that the adults who come here honestly care about them. Now, I'm not suggesting that the way that you show a young person how much they matter is by grabbing some random kid you don't know and hugging them. Don't do that, okay? Because that's weird and illegal. Don't do that, okay? But one of the easiest ways to let young people know how much they matter is by simply taking the time to show them that you care. I mean, when you come into a church on Sunday morning, you want people to say hi to you, acknowledge you, how was your week, what's going on? Our young people want the very same thing. So when you see them in the hallway, stop and say hi. Ask how they're doing. Ask what's going on in school. Ask them if they're playing any sports. Just take a few seconds to find out what's going on in their life. And I know to some of you that sounds overly simplistic, but I can't tell you how important that is, especially as little kids get older. Because one of the trends that I've seen as little kids start growing up and they become teenagers, one of the things that I've seen so many times is when a child becomes a teenager, many adults start feeling uncomfortable around them because they kind of huddle up and there's a bunch of them and they stop being friendly to them because of their age. As a lot of you know, I was a youth minister for 15 years before I moved to Cleveland to start Velocity. And whenever I would recruit volunteers for our student ministry, and we had a huge student ministry, I mean, just monstrosity. And whenever I would recruit volunteers for our youth ministry, I would always bring them in a room, and here's what I would say. I would say, now listen, um, you are going to feel really out of place for the first few weeks. 
because there are going to be way over 100 students, and there's only going to be about 15 or 20 adults. So don't be a wallflower. Don't stand in the corner waiting for them to talk to you. You, as the adult, take the lead. Go over and speak to them because teenagers are a lot like snakes. I'm like, listen, they are much more afraid of you than you should be of them, right? But what would usually happen is the first week a new volunteer would come into our youth, our youth room, I would see them standing in the corner, scared to death of all these high school students, because they're like running around, they're all testosterone and loud, you know, and they would be standing in the corner, scared to death. So I would see them, and I'd walk over to them, and I'd be like, hey, now remember, don't be a social nomad, don't stand in the corner waiting for them to talk to you, you be the leader, go and talk to them, because I can tell by the look of your face, you're feeling really out of place. And some of these volunteers would be completely freaked out. They're like, but Scott, I mean, look at them. I mean, they're, they're everywhere. I'm like, yeah, it's youth ministry. They're supposed to be here. He's like, yeah, but look at her. and Look, look at those guys. I mean, those guys, that, like that guy right there. I'm like, that guy, yeah, that guy's got black clothes and black hair, makeup and fingernail polish, and he looks scary. I'm like... <laughs> that kid, like, for real? Yeah. I'm like, well, okay, wait a second. Before you freak out about him, let me tell you how he got to look that way. One day, what happened was he borrowed his mom's minivan because he doesn't have his own car. He borrowed his mom's minivan, and he drove to the mall. When he got to the mall, he pulled into a park space, put it in park, then he walked inside the mall. When he got inside the mall, he walked into Hot Topic, and he bought those pants and that shirt. Then he left Hot Topic, drove to Walmart, bought some black hair dye and some black fingernail polish. Then he went home, dyed his hair, painted his nails, put on those clothes, and then he came here which means if you had about 60 bucks, you could look just like that, okay? okay? Don't be afraid of him. He is not a serial killer. He's just trying to express who he is. Just go over and say hi, you know? And then I would just walk away. And slowly, I would watch these volunteers kind of sneak up, like they're sneaking up on a mountain lion, you know? Like, oh, are they going to get me? And they would kind of walk up to these dudes, and they're like, Hi, you know, and the students are, hi, how, how are you? You doing good, you know? And then I, over the course of a few minutes, I would see the barrier start to fall down. And over the course of several weeks and several months, those volunteers just fell in love with those young people and they couldn't wait to see them every week. And I really want that to be the story of every student who comes to Velocity Church Because I want every student who comes here and every adult who comes here to walk away from Sunday morning knowing two very specific things. First, God loves me. But the second, the people from this church love me too. And one of the ways that we can do that is by making this an environment where our young people know that they are loved and they're accepted. But that's not all we can do. There's something else that we can do here at Velocity to make our children matter. And that's to let our little kids know how important they are by volunteering in Kid City. Now, I don't know if you know this, but in my opinion, the most important part of what happens on Sunday morning is not what takes place in this room, it's not the sermon. It's not the videos, it's not the music. The most important thing, in my opinion, that happens on a Sunday morning is what takes place in our kids' city area. Because in the four rooms down the hallway, there are a ton of adults who knock themselves out week after week to help every child understand the truth about God's love. And I cannot say enough good things about our Kid City volunteers because not only do they know your kids by name, when they are away from this building, they are the people who are hoping for them, cheering for them, praying for them, and they give countless hours to show every one of our kids how to take steps towards Jesus. As a matter of fact, 
And not too long ago, I got the opportunity to baptize one of the little girls in our Kids City program. And as I was kind of sitting there with the camera uh, doing her baptism interview, because I love interviewing kids for baptisms, because I just, I just love children, always have. But as I was doing her baptism video, I just asked her a bunch of questions. And one of the questions that I asked when I asked it, this little girl said something that just captured my heart. And I want you to hear what she had to say. Watch this. Hi, my name is Haley Hardy. I am in first grade. I love my teacher, Mrs. Bloom. Um, she's a great teacher and she's really, really kind. Aurora. Because her dress is pink and she can like dance with princes and stuff. Maybe Prince Tyler? Yes. Yes. Really handsome. Um, I love Kid City because we learn a lot about Jesus. Because he's, I know that he's my Lord and Savior and he'll always, no matter what, be my father and he'll never give up on me. Now, what made Haley's story so amazing to me is that her life as a little girl will forever be changed because there were some volunteers who chose to sacrifice their time, their love, and their energy to help her understand how much God really cares about her. And I want every little boy and every little girl who comes here to understand the very same things. I want them to understand exactly what she did. That God loves me. That he's my father. And he'll never give up on me. No matter what. And to be honest, I would much rather have you volunteer in our Kid City program on a Sunday morning than I would have you sit here and listen to me week after week. Because your one hour of investing in the life of a young person can make an eternal difference in their life. And for those of you who are thinking, but Scott, like, I don't, I don't know that much about the Bible. And, and, and I really don't, I'm really not a, like very good at prayer, so I don't know if I would really be a good Kid City volunteer. Well, for those of you who think that, I want to assure you of something. Your Bible knowledge has absolutely nothing to do with you being a great volunteer. And what I want to do is I want to prove that to you. When you came in today, you should have got a piece of paper that looks like this. So what I want you to do is this. On this, it says, most powerful Bible messages ever. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take 30 seconds and I want you to write down the five most influential Bible messages that you've ever heard. And what I want you to do is I want you to write down who taught it, the date they taught it, the text from scripture that they used and how it impacted your life. Okay, just write these down. Ready? The, I want you to, who preached it, the date they preached it, the text they used and how it impacted your life. Ready? 30 seconds. Ready? Go. Should be able to whip these right out. Exactly. Because everyone's like, I, one time I heard some guy who did something that made sense. That's almost impossible because nobody remembers that. But what if I was going to ask you this question? Instead of writing the most influential Bible messages that you've ever heard, what if I asked you to do this? What if I asked you to write down the names of five people who made you feel special when you were growing up? Could be your mom, dad, 
grandma, teacher, friend, little league coach, for most of us, it would be much easier to remember the people who loved us and made, it feel, made us feel special than it would be to write down the most influential Bible messages that we've ever heard. Here's the point. The people who have made the biggest impact in your life and mine were not the people who knew the most about the Bible. They weren't the people who knew Greek and Hebrew. The people who made the biggest impact on your life were the people who loved you and gave you their time. That's why I want all of you in some capacity to volunteer in our Kids City program or to become a youth sponsor here. And for those of you who are thinking, Scott, but I don't know, like I'm, could, could me, could like, could I really make a difference? Because I'm not sure if me volunteering in Kids City could make that big of an impact. And I don't know if me kind of being a youth sponsor could really, really help. Well, for those of you who think that, I thought you would like to hear about it from somebody whose life has been forever changed because of that very thing. You see, back in 2004, I met a 15-year-old girl whose name is Michelle DeFranco, and her entire life was turned upside down when she started going to a church that truly made children matter. So what I did was I asked uh, Michelle to be here today to tell you a little bit about her story. Would you do me a favor and welcome one of my best friends in the world, Michelle DeFranco. Okay. Hi. Hi. Good morning. So uh, first off, um, we know each other really, really well. Yeah. Um, but why don't you do this? Why don't you just take a couple minutes and tell everybody a little bit about you? Okay. Hi, I'm Michelle DeFranco. Um, so just to back up about my childhood, uh, my childhood was a real struggle. Um, to start out, my parents, I was always told that I was the child that my parents had to fix the marriage. Um, and then when I was five, they got divorced. So I always lived with the guilt of my parents divorced because of me. Um, so that was really hard. And then my, I went back and forth with my mother and my father every other weekend, every Wednesday, um, which that was difficult in itself. My mom worked a lot to, to raise us and to support us. And my sister pretty much raised me. I spent a ton of time with my sister. My sister and I were really close. And then when I was 11, my mom's work got transferred to Akron. And my dad said, hey, I've done all this driving all this time. Either you're going to drive your daughters to me or I'm not going to see them. So my mom offered to drive halfway and my dad said that wasn't enough. So needless to say, I went 10 years of my life from age 11 to 21 not having any contact with my biological father. So, and that was my teenage years, which was really rough. So not only was I living with the guilt of my parents divorcing, but now my father was out of my life. My mom got remarried. She had, um, very quickly, she had my brother who later found out had special needs. So. Needless to say, there wasn't much love in my house, and I, wasn't, I didn't feel appreciated, I didn't feel loved, I didn't feel accepted, so unfortunately, I was going other places to feel loved and accepted, and that was rough in itself. Yeah. So here you are. You're this student in high school who's got, like, like all of us could say, man, me too, I'm kind of broken. Yeah. Um, but then... Something very interesting happened. Yeah. Why don't you tell everybody what happened when you were in high school? Yeah, so when I was in high school, I tried to join all these clubs because I knew something needed to change in my life. Um, but that really didn't do much of anything. So I met this girl, and I'll never forget her. We actually keep in contact now. Her name's Mindy Norman. And we were very, very different people, but for some reason, we just bonded. And I remember she invited me to go see The Passion of the Christ. And I remember I knew something in my life needed to change um, just because I was looking for love and acceptance in all these wrong ways. And I knew that something different didn't change. I, I say to this day, I would be six feet under if I wouldn't have gone to this movie with her. And the funny thing was, I was a teenager and she invited me to the movie and she invited my, my ex-boyfriend's new girlfriend. And I was like, why do I even want to go to this movie? Um, ridiculous, I know. But I decided to go anyway, because I knew in my heart something needed to change. So I just remember, I can picture me in that movie theater, um, 
watching The Passion of the Christ, reading the subtitles, and I just remember grabbing Mindy's hand, and I was like, this is it. This is, this is, this is my life change happening right now. So at the end of the movie, there was a young girl that stood up and they did an altar call and I went back and I was at a prayer circle and this is when I met Scott and Vanessa and I was holding Vanessa's hand and she prayed for us. And I was like, oh, like you can pray for me. Like I'm that important that you can spend time to pray for me. And that's when I knew like God is, God is my change and I, I, need to, I need to follow up and I need to know more about this. Mm-hmm. So your follow-up was, uh, after this movie, you started going to a church, yeah. um, which, was, which was very different because you'd never really gone. Right, right. So tell everybody a little bit about how you felt when you first started going to this church. So it was so cool. I remember walking in and seeing smiley faces and people giving me hugs. And I was like, well, I don't, people don't hug me. And people were giving me hugs and asking me how I was doing. And everybody was just so welcoming. And for the first time in my life, I was like, I'm accepted for who I am. And I don't have to fake it. I don't have to do all these things to be accepted. Like people here genuinely love me for who I am. And then we started doing all these fun things, like they took me paintballing, like you wanna take me paintballing? Which don't ever go paintballing with me because this means shoot me, not I'm out. We quickly <laughs> learned that. Um, and I, we go to Summer in the Sun and we did, we did overnighters and I was like, these people genuinely care for me. These people are giving their time for me and all these other kids and it was just incredible to me to think that all these people, they're showing up on Sunday morning to love on me. And I didn't ask them to, they wanted to. I didn't beg them to, they wanted to. I didn't ask them for a hug. Like, they wanted to hug me. They wanted to ask me how my day was. And they didn't, most of them didn't know what my life was like. They didn't know that I struggled in school. They didn't know all these other things. They just loved me for who I was. And that was, that was, that was God. And that was what I needed in my life. Mm. But the love that you felt from this church didn't stop when you graduated high school. The love that you felt from this church just continued to go. Why don't you tell a little bit about what this church did for you, what these people who loved you did once you graduated? Right, so I graduated from high school and then I went to the University of Akron and I studied education, um, actually. And I loved what I was studying, but um, my mom and I had a really strange relationship. I still wasn't talking to my father, so I struggled financially really bad. I knew if I didn't get myself through school and pursue my passion of working with kids, then I, I don't know what I would do with my life. So I pushed myself really, really hard to continue to go to college, but it was hard because my mom didn't help, my dad wasn't around, my brother had special needs, so my mom's attention was on him, and it, it was rough. So I just remember I would go to, I would still try my hardest to get to church every week, and Scott would hand me these bank envelopes, and he would say, hey, I just want you to know, we love you, I can't tell you who this is from, but they would, he would hand me envelopes of money to get me through, and I was like, well, somebody loves me so much that they wanna help me in this way, not only spend time with me and love me, but help me financially, like that was incredible, and that happened multiple times, and still to this day, I, I don't know who this person was, but. I call them my guardian angel because it was like every single time that I was ready to throw my hands up in the air, it's like, it's like they knew. Um, so at this time, I was in college and I was working two to three jobs and my mom kicked me out of the house. <laughs> yeah. So my mom kicked me out of the house. I, I, thankfully, I was able to be an RA, so they were able to pay my housing. But I was still working two to three jobs, working my butt off, going to school, still studying what I love to do, <laughs> but I worked a half hour away from school. And I, I drove a 92 Thunderbird, which I thought I was, I thought I was awesome. And I had to drive the highway every, every day to get there. And something happened in my car, and I don't remember what it was, but I knew I had to take it to the shop. So they called me shortly after, and they're like, ma'am, I'm really sorry, but your car, we can't repair it. It's not that I totaled my car. It's just it was so old and not taken care of. And they said, I'm sorry, we can't repair your car. The bottom of your car is completely rusted through. We don't suggest that you drive it, especially on the highway. Well, okay. Well, how am I supposed to support myself? How am I supposed to get to school, to get to work, and all these other things? And I'll never forget the call. Scott called me, and he said, hey, um, I just want you to know that we love you, and somebody, um, there's a dealership 
there's a car ready for you to pick up. You know we love you, you know I can't tell you who did this, but somebody bought you a car. <laughs> wow. Um, again, my guardian angel at work still, or yeah, at work, I have no idea who this person was. Um, but right then and there, they knew, and it's somebody at church, somebody loved on me, not because they had to, but because they chose to and because they wanted to. And because of that, I was able to keep pursuing my passion. I graduated college, and I still stay in contact with a lot of these people because they made a big difference in my life. Mm. So here's the part of the story um, that most people don't know. Because Mindy invited Michelle to see a movie. Michelle got to be a part of our student ministry for years. Then Michelle and Vanessa had been very, very close. One night, uh, she invited Michelle to come to Cleveland because she was living in Akron. She came, she started coming to Velocity. She came to our small group. Uh, while she was at our small group, uh, she met a boy. <laughs> Yes, magic happens in small group people. It's true, it's true. <laughs> Listen, if you're not of a part of a small group, but she did actually, she, she, met a, she met a really, really nice guy who goes to other campus as well, whose name is Joe DeFranco, and uh, they got married, and now Michelle has uh, had her first baby, and here's why I'm telling you this. This is so huge. Her life... It's completely different. Because the church said, we love you. Mm -hmm. We know you're in high school. Mm -hmm. We know your family's a little bit different. We love you. And her life today is totally different because of people like you. Mm. So if you were gonna say one thing to everybody sitting here today, just like, this is like my heart, please hear this. What would you say to them? Get involved um, in any way you can, um, whether that be youth group or Kid City or greeting team, just hugging and loving on those kids as they walk into the door. In any way possible that you can get involved to make a difference in the life of a child, I urge you, do it, and do it now. Because if I, I really feel in my heart that if that wouldn't have happened to me right when it did, I wouldn't be here to tell my story right now. And I praise God for that all the time. So get involved. Love on these children. Don't do it randomly like you were saying earlier because that's a little creepy. <laughs> but hug, hug these kids. Ask them how they're doing. Ask them because you don't know what they're going through at home. My home life was a struggle. They didn't know that, but they still loved on me anyway. So I felt accepted. Help these children feel accepted, feel loved love on them, and get involved. Yeah. So when I was doing student ministry, um, and we, like I said, we had a big youth group, but whenever I would have uh, seniors graduate out of high school before they went to college or to the workforce, I would always take the seniors in, uh, who graduated out to eat, and I would always, I always ask them this question. I would always say, what do you remember most about growing up at this church? What do you remember most? And to be honest, when I asked young people that question, like seniors in high school, I wanted them to say, like, oh, Scott, it was the way that you gave us great exegetical Bible study <laughs> and humor. And Scott, you, you gave us action steps that we could use all throughout middle school and high school. Scott, your lessons changed my life. You know what? 15 years in student ministry, 25 years in ministry, I've never had a young person say that. <laughs> Do you know what they say? They say things like, I remember when we were in, in the gym and I was playing basketball and I threw that basketball across the gym and it came down and hit you in the side of the face and you got mad. So you ran across the gym to tackle me and slammed my head off the floor. You remember that? That's, that's funny. <laughs> Like, Scott, I remember the time we were on our way to camp, and we got a flat tire in the van, and you said I could help you change the flat tire, and we were jacking up the van, and the semi came by and blew the van off the jacks, and it almost crushed your legs, and you didn't cuss. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you didn't cuss. <laughs> like, but I just didn't say, like, Scott... I remember that time when my parents were going through a divorce. 
And you called me on the phone and you asked how it was going and you said I could spend the night at your house. I remember when we were at Summer in the Sun and we were sitting on the benches outside of Lesby Center and we were just talking. I don't remember what we talked about, but I remember walking away thinking, man, Scott and Vanessa really love me. There are a lot of things that the young people who come here will remember about growing up at Velocity. But the things that they're going to remember most are our personal integrity, our love for Jesus, and the time that we spend with them. So let's be a church that truly makes children matter by doing those three things. Let me pray for us. God, thank you so much for the impact that, um, that you've allowed us to have. Thank you for the young people from birth to high school and college who come here and they call this their home. But God, for every adult in this room, would you never, God, never allow us to overlook Never allow us to overlook the responsibility on our shoulders to make this a place where every young person knows that they're loved and they're accepted. And God, please allow us to never be so wrapped up in our own schedule that we forget to invest in the people who come here. Um, God, thank you so much just for the chance we got to be here this morning. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.